Good morning, everybody. I'm Howard Chansky. I'm the chair of the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. I want to welcome everybody to our first uh, grand rounds of what we could consider to be the summer. And we're very fortunate to have one of our uh, former residents, Brett Wired, here to give us grand rounds. Uh, before we move on to grand rounds, there was one uh, kudos that Planet received. And this was regarding Billy Crutcher. And this note is from um, Kyle Dietrich. And it states, I wanted to thank Dr. Crutcher for so much for the excellent care that you provided to my 22-month-old daughter, Quinn, on Friday night at Seattle Children's ED. Putting a cast on a toddler at 1 a.m. is not an enviable task, but you were so patient and kind. I truly appreciate how hard you work and the sacrifices you make as a resident physician. I know you spend a lot of time away from your own family so that you can take care of families like mine when needed. Uh, so that's really a, a, a great uh, letter. And thank you, Billy, for providing your usual um, stellar care. And with that, we'll uh, move on to um, Grand Rounds. Uh, Grand Rounds today is Current Concepts in Shoulder Surgery, and it's going to be by Dr. Brett Wyder and Dr. Talif Khan, one of our, our three residents. Um, I'm sure all of you know by now that Dr. Wyder, Wyder was one of our former residents, and, and all of us, I'm sure, remember him the same way as just being a fantastic, hardworking, um, talented resident who took care, great care of all of our patients. Uh, Dr. Wyder went on to do both a shoulder and elbow surgery fellowship at William Beaumont Hospital, uh, where I might add, um, there's a, a small family dynasty. I think his dad and two of his brothers are all orthopedic surgeons um, there. And Right after his residency, he did a hand and microvascular surgery fellowship at UCSD. And Dr. Wider has gone on to um, have an excellent uh, career, uh, both academically and clinically, with um, him being an editor of multiple journals and, and also uh, publishing uh, quite a bit and, and receiving recognition uh, from his um, local uh, press for uh, being one of the best doc best orthopedic surgeons every year. Uh, and so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Khan and Dr. Wyder. Thanks, Dr. Chansey. Um, let's see. Is this uh, coming up on your screens? Yes, we looks can. good. Okay, awesome. Um, so for those of you who haven't worked with me, I'm Talif, um, one of the R3s. Uh, today's discussion will be on current concepts of shoulder arthroplasty. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Um, a brief overview of my talk. Um, we'll talk about the biomechanics of the shoulder. Uh, we'll discuss arthritic diseases, and then we'll look at implant options. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Weider. Uh, who will uh, talk more specifically about total shoulder arthroplasty and specifically uh, stemless options. Um, starting with the biomechanics, um, the shoulder joint is a, a minimally constrained ball and socket joint um, that provides the greatest range of motion of any joint in the human body. Um, it's interesting though, because the, the glenoid um, only represents about 30% of the surface area of the humerus. So a lot of the um, uh, stability that comes from the, the shoulder joint is actually uh, from the soft tissue surrounding the joint. Um, and so there are two uh, categories of um, soft tissue that provides stability uh, for the shoulder, uh, starting with the static stabilizers. Um, and this includes things like the joint surface, um, but also the negative intraarticular pressure, which uh, prevents uh, translation of the humerus. Um, the glenoid labrum, which is a fibrocartilaginous um, uh, structure that uh, surrounds the periphery of the, of the glenoid and increases the, the space to about 50% of the surface area of the, the humerus. Um, you have the capsule and then the glenohumeral ligament complex, uh, which provides check reins for um, the extreme, range of, uh, extreme ranges of motion. Um, 
this is a picture here of, of those uh, the glenohumeral ligament complex. Uh, the dynamic stabilizers includes things like the rotator cuffs, um, which provide contraction and, and essentially compression of the humerus into the glenoid. Um, and then the scapular stabilizing muscles, which uh, provide um, uh, stabiliz stabilizes the shoulder uh, by stabilizing some of the other structures in the area. Uh, looking at the arthritic disease of the shoulder, there's, this isn't a comprehensive list, but uh, some of the ones that um, I included in the talk are degenerative, inflammatory, cup tear arthropathy, uh, non-traumatic avascular necrosis, and uh, neurotropic arthropathy. Uh, it's really important to diagnose uh, accurately what a patient's um, arthritic condition is, because that really helps in, in um, figuring out what type of implant to use um, and how to best treat them. Um, so starting with degenerative arthritis, um, the glenoid cartilage in this case is, is uh, typically worn out posteriorly. The humeral head and the glenoid have a flattened appearance. There's a triad of uh, anterior capsular contraction, uh, posterior glenoid wear, and posterior humeral head subluxation. Here's a, a nice x-ray that de demonstrates all of those things. So you've got the flattened humeral head um, here on the x-ray. You, you can see it's uh, posterior translated and the, the posterior glenoid is, is being worn out. Um, and that can be really important when you're thinking about the type of implant to use and um, where to put the implants because if you if you have predominantly posterior glenoid wear, you know, you could potentially have a, a biconcave glenoid. So it's important to, to smooth something like that out. Um, inflammatory conditions are another cause of uh, arthritis in the shoulder. Uh, typically, the cartilage is destroyed evenly across the entire surface. Um, in addition to that, there are erosions of the subchondral bone. And this can be really important because this eventually leads to osteopenia. And so if you're thinking about uh, an implant option like uh, uh, with a stemmed component, um, you could be concerned about uh, fixation into that um, osteopenic bone. Typically, these patients have bilateral disease, and it also affects multiple joints. Uh, other considerations for patients that have um, inflammatory arthritis is that um, their soft tissue envelope is pretty fragile. Um, you know, obviously they'll, they'll have a number of immunosuppressive medications, which can also uh, complicate wound healing. Um, and like I mentioned previously, erosions can lead to osteopenia, which can compromise um, the implant. Um, the other major uh, arthritic condition is cup tear arthropathy here, a chronic massive tear of the rotator cuff. Uh, leads to uh, proximal uh, humeral migration. And over time, it basically, um, there's a, abrasions along the, the humerus uh, uh, on the coracoacromial arch, uh, which eventually leads to uh, arthritis. Uh, Non-traumatic avascular necrosis is another cause. Uh, these, this can be uh, related to uh, systemic steroids, like um, you know, using an inflammatory arthritis or sickle cell anemia, chronic alcohol use, and radiation therapy. And finally, uh, neurotrophic arthropathy. And this is any condition uh, where you have loss of the, the nervous nerve supply, um, which leads to an abnormal loading of the joint, um, which progresses to bone destruction and osseous debris, and finally, end stage uh, arthritis. Uh, implant options here, I'm gonna focus primarily on hemiarthroplasty um, because Dr. Weider has a, has a pretty good talk about the other two. Um, and just looking at the hemiarthroplasty, there are three uh, main ones to consider. Uh, one is a hemiarthroplasty with a stemmed humeral component. The other option is a resurfacing hemiarthroplasty. And finally, a hemiarthroplasty with extended coverage uh, or a CTA, um, it's often referred to. Um, so starting with the first one, uh, this is the hemiarthroplasty with a stemmed uh, humeral component. On imaging, it might look something like this. Um, and it was initially developed for proximal humerus fractures, uh, but indications now include uh, primary osteoarthritis where the glenoid is spared, uh, arthritic conditions where the glenoid bone stock is limited, and early, oste early osteonecrosis without glenoid involvement. Some of the contraindications for this are, include glenoid wear or arthrosis. So obviously, if you have arthritis of the glenoid and you only replace uh, the humeral uh, head, then you know the patients could still have pretty significant pain. So uh, and then incongruent uh, glenoid surfaces. We kind of talked about this with um, uh, osteo uh, degenerative osteoarthritis that, um, you know, if you have posterior glenoid wear and the anterior glenoid is spared, then 
uh, that leads to an incongruent uh, glenoid surface. And um, in these patients, the hemiarthroplasty um, uh, is not, uh, does not have the same satisfaction in their uh, results as um, uh, patients that have a concave uh, glenoid. And, and there was a study done by uh, Levine et al. that reviewed 31 patients uh, who underwent uh, hemiarthroplasty for uh, glenohumeral arthritis. Um, they classified uh, the glenoid either concentric versus non-concentric, uh, and this was based on their intraoperative and radiographic finding. Uh, and based on the near score, about 86% of the patients with the concentric glenoid had a good or excellent result, uh, whereas 63% of those that had a non-concentric glenoid had an excellent result. Um, so you can see it's somewhat different in, in terms of uh, outcomes if you don't have a, a concentric glenoid. Your next option is a resurfacing hemiarthroplasty. Uh, and here, just the um, a portion of the femoral head is, is replaced, just the articular surface. Um, and, and the advantages of this is that there's a preservation of the humeral head and maintenance of the head and neck shaft angle, uh, offset inclination and inversion. Um, and this is ideal for younger, more active patients where bone, bone sparing procedures are preferred. There's some talk in the literature that uh, it can potentially facilitate conversion to a total sh shoulder arthroplasty, but um, in some of the literature, the results were pretty variable. Uh, Bailey et al. reviewed 36 patients um, under the age of 55 that had pretty significant glenohumeral arthritis without osteonecrosis and had a follow-up of 38.1 of months. Um, patients did significantly better before, or I'm sorry, after surgery than they did before. Um, and then lastly, the hemiarthroplasty with extended coverage uh, head. Um, this is the very useful in, in cup tear arthropathy. Again, there's proximal migration of the humeral head in these patients that leads to articulation of the humerus on the acromion, eventually causes acetabularization of the glenoid uh, and the acromion with femoralization of the humerus, basically just smoothing out the tuberosities as, the, as it continues to wear out. Um, and in those cases, um, a hemiarthroplasty with extended uh, coverage head can be very useful to sort of you know, give it articulation uh, across the acromion as well as the glenoid. I'll turn it over now to Dr. Weider, uh, who will talk more specifically about uh, reverse total shoulders and uh, total shoulder arthroplasty. All right. Can then you guys hear me and see my screen here? Look and sound good. All right. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak at my alma mater, albeit uh, virtually, but it is a true honor. Got to give a shout out to my classmates. We were the class of 2011. Um, just want to let, tell all the residents that you'll develop lifelong bonds with your classmates and uh, cherish every moment. These, uh, the, as in most things in life, it goes by quite quickly. I also have to give, uh, extend a gratitude to this man who's developed my, helped develop my passion for shoulder surgery, as well as, well as helping develop my foundation of knowledge. Here are my disclosures, and in terms of uh, full disclosure, I am a, uh, a paid consultant and a stock owner in Catalyst Orthoscience. So we're going to start with a quote from the godfather of shoulder surgery, Dr. Charles Neer. His, he's quoted as saying, the design of the prosthesis should mimic normal anatomy. Implants made with this principle in mind have provided the best function and durability. And I want everyone to keep that in mind as we go throughout this talk. So the reverse total shoulder has gained a lot of popularity in recent years. There's a lot of surgeons that simply do reverse total shoulder for all indications. And I wanna take the first part of this talk to, to explain why the anatomic is a better option for primary OA. It leads to better outcomes, less complications and easier revisions. We gotta define glenohumeral OA or primary glenohumeral OA, and that's degenerative joint disease in the absence of other etiology, i.e. cuff tears, post-traumatic changes, AVN, inflammatory conditions, post-surgical 
complications or, or sequelae, i.e. post capsulorophy arthropathy or congenital problems like glenoid dysplasia. Primary glenohumeral OA is diagnosed radiographically. It involves usually an intact rotator cuff. On the grassy view, you'll see joint space narrowing with or without medialization of the joint. There'll be osteophytes and cysts in the glenoid and humeral head. An important thing to notice on these radiographs is that there is a maintained acromiohumeral interval of seven millimeters or greater, indicating a functional rotator cuff. On the axillary view, you'll see again joint space narrowing with or without medialization of the joint, post, potentially posterior subluxation of the joint, and subsequent glenoid biconcavity. The anatomic is superior to the reverse for primary OA for three reasons. It's an anatomic procedure, it's stable technology, and in my experience has a lower rate of complications. The anatomic restores the normal shoulder kinematics. It's like the native joint in unconstrained articulation. In general, we attempt to achieve the normal glenohumeral mismatch, which is the difference in radius of curvature in the humeral head and the glenoid. When done well, it restores the concavity compression function of the rotator cuff and reestablishes the stable fulcrum of the, at the glenohumeral joint. In general, force vectors are unchanged. The center of rotation remains in the center of the humeral head. The joint is stable and internal and external rotation forces are maintained, leading to good range of motion postoperatively. Any implant that deviates from the normal kinematics has a potential to negatively affect outcome. Now the reverse is obviously a very non-anatomic procedure. It dramatically alters the shoulder kinematics. We all know this is a, a, a semi-constrained articulation and the center of rotation, which was once at the center of the humeral head is now distalized and medialized with the anatomic, we achieve better range of motion. There's been several clinical studies that show both improved internal rotation and external rotation when compared to the reverse. External rotation is important for virtually all activities of daily living that are performed above the waist, such as combing one's hair, washing the hair, using a utensil, drinking from a cup, et cetera. Uh, internal rotation is obviously important for personal hygiene. The anatomic procedure has been, a long, has been around for a long, long time, and as such is relatively stable technology. The first generation implants that Talif alluded to came out in the 1950s. This was the near one hemiarthroplasty, which was initially indicated for proximal humerus fractures. This was a monoblock implant uh, stem and head uh, implant, and only a single size was available. Currently, I would say we're on the fourth generation of implants, which are more anatomic than ever, very much bone preserving, making future revision surgeries relatively straightforward. Now the reverse is an unstable or rather an evolving technology currently. And this was only a FDA approved in our country in 2004. And in this day and age, there's still multiple controversies that exist. We can't even agree on what is the most uh, the, the superior implant design. There's implants that have an inlay humeral design versus an onlay. And it's also quite controversial where to put the center of rotation, whether it's more medialized or less medialized. All designs uh, distalize and medialize the center of rotation to a certain degree. Also somewhat controversial is the, is the surgical approach and management of the soft tissues, particularly the subscapularis. In my experience, the anatomic has a, a much lower rate of complications, but it is not without complications. Glenoid loosening is, is a persistent problem and subscapularis deficiency after an anatomic is catastrophic. In my experience, the reverse has a higher rate of complications, including infection, instability, with an, an unstable reverse is a problem that's difficult to deal with and you run out of options very quickly. I've had a few patients over the years that had persistent instability 
which now have essentially a resection arthroplasty or no shoulder whatsoever. Pathologic fractures are unique to the reverse. Here's a case I did early in practice, and you can see the upper left radiograph is, is early post-op uh, early post-op image. The lower right shows a subtle change. This patient presented with an atraumatic onset of pain and poor elevation. And you can see when comparing these two radiographs that there's a difference in the acromion. The acromion is now tilted down, uh, indicating a, the dreaded a scapular insufficiency fracture. My general treatment for these scapular insufficiency fractures is non-operative. And generally, thankfully, these patients tend to do reasonably well after, after the initial acute pain subsides. And most patients regain above shoulder forward elevation with minimal pain. This particular patient went on to have a symptomatic non-union so we've treated, we treated him with attempted ORIF or non-union repair. And you can see a pretty invasive approach with some violation of the deltoid. There's a small laminar spreader within the non-union site. The bone at the acromion distally and anteriorly is very thin and is, does not support stable fixation. So in this case, we used a hook plate, which was designed for a left shoulder and reversed it placing the hook portion underneath the acromion to keep it elevated. And this was augmented with a nitinol staple. Here's his early post-operative films. Unfortunately, he went on to a persistent non-union and uh, indicating the difficulty in treating these, these symptomatic non-union patients. Hematomas after a reverse are also a complication which is more common. That's likely related to the extensive dissection that's required for a reverse, as well as the subsequent dead space that allows blood to accumulate. Sometimes these are, are problematic and that they can cause nerve compression. And I've had patients with longstanding brachial plexus injuries from what I attribute to a postoperative hematoma. Neurologic injuries are more common after the reverse. Thankfully, they're not very common, but when they do, they're, they're disabling. I, I, a lot of patients with median nerve dysfunction post-surgically that didn't respond well to a, uh, a carpal tunnel release. Some of these injuries are permanent. I've seen patients who've had reverses at outside hospitals with a complete brachial plexopathy post-operatively that was permanent. Implant failure after the reverse is, is, is uncommon, but it, it does occur. And when that happens, the, the results are, and outcomes are understandably uh, catastrophic. Sometimes these are revisable. Sometimes these are, um, are not uh, fixable. So why do we use a stem and shoulder arthroplasty? It's uh, likely a legacy of the total hip. It does provide stable fixation and works well in most instances. With modular implants, we can customize our, our, uh, our implants to our patient's anatomy and help restore center of rotation. There are disadvantages to stemmed implants. Those include loosening and stress shielding, periprosthetic fracture, difficult future revision surgery, when there's a malunion or old hardware, it's difficult to use a stemmed implant. And when stemmed implants be, uh, become infected, it's somewhat problematic. The stress shielding is best understood by examining the bending rigidity of the cylinder. The rigidity of a cylinder is proportional to the radius of curvature to the fourth power. So small increases in the radius of curvature lead to dramatic increases in bending stiffness. And we know from Wolf's law that bone remodels according to the stresses that it's subjected to. And when you have a very stiff implant, there's very little bone remodeling and simply bone resorption leading to weak portions around the implant and potential uh, uh, stress, or excuse me, potential uh, pathologic periprosthetic fractures. Here's a patient that I revised a few years ago that had a, a really thick anatomic stem that was placed. And you can see how dramatic some of the, the bone resorption is around the proximal humeral stem. 
Periprosthetic fractures are, again, the result of the stiffness of a standard stem. If you have a periprosthetic fracture around a short stem, it's a relatively straightforward ORIF using a slightly longer than normal or standard proximal humeral locking plate. But it, when they become comminuted, the extent, the dissection and, and uh, surgery is much more involved. As we go longer with the stems, again, the dissection and surgery becomes much more involved and may necessitate plating the entire humeral shaft. Humeral loosening is an uncommon but present complication of a humeral stem. Here's a, an example of a loose hemiarthroplasty, which did not happen to be infected and she sustained a pathologic fracture at the tip of the stem. And this was treated with a very long stem that spanned the entire length of the humeral shaft. And she was converted to a reverse. Cemented stems are, are a huge nightmare, especially when the entire humeral canal is cemented. And these uh, are painstaking revisions. The um, Extracting the stem is one thing, but re getting all the cement out without destroying the humerus is very challenging. I would suggest using a cement extraction device uh, like the Oscar. You got to be careful because it gets really hot and you can, you can cause thermal injury to the radial nerve in the spiral groove. The um, Getting cement out of a humerus is, is, is much more challenging than it is getting it out of a femur just the, uh, due to the diffness in, uh, difference in cortical thickness. And again, it's quite easy to destroy a humerus trying to get a well-fixed cemented stem out. Here's an example of a case I did early in practice. Now this didn't, this was not a cemented stem, but was well-fixed distally and very thin cortical bone. And as I used the uh, slap hammer, to, the vice grip slap hammer to remove the stem, I fractured the humerus. And you can see that's the humerus around the distal aspect of that stem. Thankfully, I had a proximal humeral replacement implant available, and that's what I had to use in that patient. Obviously not ideal. In settings of male unions, stemmed implants are, are difficult, if not impossible to use. Here's a recent case I did. This is a 50-some-year-old paramedic who had had a, a capsulography procedure as a youth who had bad OA, and he sustained a surgical neck proximal humerus fracture. We attempted to treat him non-operatively. We allowed his fracture to heal, but he remained symptomatic. So in this patient, we did a resurfacing implant, avoided the ostea, or avoided the deformity in the proximal humerus, and he's gone on to have a very good outcome. Prior hardware is also problematic for using a stemmed implant. Here's another case where we used a resurfacing implant to, to avoid a large dissection and hardware removal. When stemmed implants become infected, it's problematic. Much of the humeral canal becomes contaminated and surgeries to eradicate the infection have to involve uh, the uh, treating the humeral canal with something like a prostolac spacer as seen in here. This was a case of a resurfacing that got infected and you can see a much more straightforward problem. The presumably only the proximal humeral metaphysis is infected uh, as is the glenoid and the, the shoulder joint. This patient was treated with a small antibiotic spacer and basically a standard, a standard surgery uh, conversion to a reverse, which wasn't much more difficult than, than a primary reverse total shoulder. So the demand for bone preserving options in the shoulder is expected to increase. Over the next 20 years, there's expected to be a 700% increase in patients that need total shoulders and a 300% increase in patients less than 55 that need a total shoulder. There have been some studies that have examined traditional stemmed implants and have shown that younger patients have had worse results results in higher dissatisfaction than older patients. And I would say now we need bone preserving anatomic options more than ever. Our current bone preserving options can allow for a standard approach to the glenoid. They utilize a standard humeral neck cut. When you don't instrument the humerus, uh, 
the there's reductions in OR time, blood loss, potential complications and infections. You avoid much of the problem associated with stress shielding and stress risers. And the uh, intact humerus is preserved for any future revision surgery. The first resurfacing implant was pioneered by Stephen Copeland in the UK in the 80s. This is a non anatomic implant, it's spherical in nature, but he showed a, a good longevity with this device and a very low rate of loosening, less than 1%. Newer resurfacing implants on the market have attempted to recreate the normal geometry of the proximal humerus. The humeral head is greater in the medial lateral dimension than it is in the A to P. It's, we call that ovoid or ellipsoid resembling an egg as opposed to a sphere. Here's a case of a surgical neck malunion with primary OA. This patient was treated with a resurfacing total shoulder with a good outcome. The traditional Copeland resurfacings have their issues. Implant placement is, is relatively difficult. It's easy to put these in excess varus or valgus or excess aniversion or retroversion, and it's certainly easy to overstuff the joint, which is medialization of the implant and over tensioning of the soft tissues. Because much of the humeral head is preserved, access to the glenoid is somewhat limited. And another third problem with this implant is that it's implanted in cancellous bone, which may not be ideal for an osteoporotic individual. Here's just some representative radiographs of some mis- placed or malpositioned resurfacing implants. So the two modern implant designs of our stemless total shoulders consist of what I would call canal sparing. These implants utilize a standard neck cut and they're some sort of base plate or central screw which is implanted in the metaphysis. This is then uh, mated to a a spherical humeral head, so they're not exactly anatomic. And the newest uh, player in the game is this canal sparing multiplanar osteotomy implant, which attempts to recreate the normal geometry of the proximal humerus. And we'll get into that a bit more in a few minutes. So the canal, the Standard neck cut canal sparing implants offer normal glenoid exposure. You can instrument the glenoid perpendicular, perpendicularly using standard instrumentation. The alignment of the, the humeral implant can be placed anatomically. You can place it in a best fit in the metaphyseal neck cut. It's independent of the humeral canal and certainly preserves the entirety of the humeral shaft. One of the controversies with our canal sparing options is what to do with the subscapularis. There's a surgeons who, elect, who uh, prefer an osteotomy of the lesser tuberosity. They think that bone to bone healing may be more reliable and it's something you can follow on radiographs. A lot of surgeons don't think that an osteotomy is possible with these stemless designs. So most do an, a tenotomy, which is perfectly acceptable. Um, Here's a study, one of the early studies out of Europe that looked at a longer term follow up of this is the test implant. And they showed over six years that this implant showed very little signs of loosening and when used in both the hemiarthroplasty and total shoulder arthroplasty settings. So there are situations not to use a stemless implant and we should default to a standard stem when there's a lack of sufficient bone to seat and support the implant. This may be seen in a post-traumatic setting or a developmental problem. In severely osteoporotic individuals, they may be best treated with a standard stemmed implant or those with erosive arthritis with cystic change to the proximal humerus. Another category is avascular necrosis. There's a lot of surgeons that think a stemmed implant is, is indicated in osteo, uh, uh, osteonecrosis or AVN. So it's probably not a bad idea to always have a stemmed implant available at your hospital when you first start doing stemless implants.
So there's several on the market. The first stemless implant was the Biomet test, which was introduced in the early 2000s in Europe. It consists of this metagoline or a base plate. This particular one has a ring of fins or petals that attaches to a modular humeral head. Currently, there's eight devices on the market. They were FDA approved in the US in 2015. Some of the early studies out of Europe examining this test showed promising early results with very little incidence of humeral loosening or complications. Uh, one of the early studies showed some, some intraoperative complications, but in general, longer term or midterm complications were, were nil. A more recent implant on the market is the Tournier Simplicity. This was launched in April 2011. Over 10,000 have been implanted in 15 countries. Some countries, that's the go-to implant for an anatomic total shoulder. And outside the U.S. Simplicity study showed comparable, comparable results to our U.S. IDE study and also comparable to stemmed devices. The simplicity was subjected to an IDE study in our country to examine its, its efficacy and safety. This was published in JBJS in 2011, uh, 2016. The um, study was a single arm, 150 patient study with 14 sites and 16 surgeons. We used a composite endpoint. This required two year follow up. Patients were your typical shoulder arthroplasty or total shoulder arthroplasty patients. Uh, mean age 66 years, 71% males. Most patients had primary glenohumeral OA. Dominant limb was half the cases, and we had a 95% follow up rate at the required 24 month visit. Our radiographs were examined independently, and our independent radiologists found no radiolucent zones, no implant uh, migration, subsidence osteolysis or any loosening in general. But again, this was at two years uh, outcome. There were three cases of, so no intraoperative complications, no system related adverse events and three revisions in the study period. One was related to an infection, one was related to subscap failure and one was related to glenoid loosening. Our clinical outcomes were satisfactory and comparable to the standard stemmed implants with respect to simple shoulder tests, ASCS scores, VAS pain scores, and range of motion. We then stratified our patients based on age. Our question was, do younger patients do better than older patients given the potential osteoporosis and lack of bone density in our older patients? And we found that Despite the patient's age, they all did well with respect to their clinical outcome, and that more importantly, there was no difference in radiographic outcome amongst age groups. So the conclusion was that this stemless, this uh, simplicity was safe and efficacious for shoulder arthroplasty. Study completed in 2014, commercialized in 15. 4,000 plus cases have been used uh, without any uh, significant issues or recalls. And there's over 600 surgeons that use this implant as their implant of choice. Another implant that's in the, outside the US that has gained popularity is the situs. This implant has been used thousands of times and there, it's been studied in Europe. This has been approved in 2018. The most recent implant to hit the market is the Biomet Comprehensive Nano. This is currently the subject of an ongoing IDE trial. All the patients have been enrolled, enrolled and had their surgery. We're just waiting on the two-year follow-up. This study is somewhat unique in that it is a prospective randomized blinded study that is comparing this nano to a mini stem. So there are still drawbacks using uh, stem, uh, stemless implants, they're still very expensive. It may be difficult to get hospitals to pay the extra amount for this newer technology. There is very much a learning curve and it, that's not only with surgeon technique, but also patient selection. And again, using these hemispherical implants, recreation of the proximal humerus is 
uh, elusive. So I want to take a step back and talk again a little bit more about the normal anatomy of the humeral head. There are variable parameters and constant parameters amongst individuals. There's a, a wide variety amongst individuals with respect to head and shaft offset, I, which is the center of the humeral head as opposed to the axis of the, the humeral canal. Neck shaft angle is very or highly variable as is the amount of version. Amongst individuals, there are some constants and that is the head height to humeral head radius ratio as well as all individuals, most individuals do have the non-spherical uh, geometry of the humeral head, which is greater in the medial lateral distance than it is in the A to P distance. For these variable parameters, the standard stemless uh, implant that I was just talking about is satisfactory, but for these constants, the stemless is not so good at recreating proximal humeral anatomy. And that's where this, the newest implant comes into play, which is the multiplanar osteotomy implant made by Catalyst. And this implant is unique in that it preserves much of the proximal humeral bone, and it is somewhat analogous to the distal femoral component of a total knee. And the, there's multiple osteotomies, uh, which are essentially the chamfer cuts. And if you look in the lower left, the lower left uh, CT scan, the blue line represents the amount of bone or the cuts that are made using this, this newer system versus the neck cut with the standard stemless or standard stemmed implants. And you can see the difference in bone density between these neck cuts. So this implant sits on relatively dense subchondral bone. Again, the humeral head, I can't say it enough, is non-spherical. When you look at it in cross-section, it's oval versus our standard implants, which are circular. I think this is important when you're looking at your axillary radiographs. When this implant is placed properly, there's virtually no overhang anteriorly and posteriorly. And I think this is beneficial to function of the posterior cuff, but also function of your anterior cuff, which is your subscapularis and likely allows uh, subscap to heal without any impingement from your implant. With this implant, the amount of bone that's removed is equal to the bone that's replaced by the implant, making it relatively anatomic. It's generally straightforward, kind of like a total knee. There's less judgment calls. You place your guide pin, your reamer, followed by your cutting guides. One of the problems with this implant is approaching the glenoid. Again, much of the humeral head is preserved with this implant and access to the glenoid using standard instrumentation is challenging. Standard instrumentation uses a perpendicular approach to the glenoid. And the way that this implant has gotten around it is by designing implants or designing instruments to approach the shoulder from the anterior. There's been several studies that have looked at the center of rotation after standard total shoulders versus resurfacing versus this newer multiplanar osteotomy option. And the multiplanar osteotomy option tends to outperform standard total shoulder or the Copeland resurfacing type implant in terms of restoring center of rotation. A radiographic study uh, published by Dr. Goldberg, who was the designer of this implant, looked at stemmed implants versus the multiplanar osteotomy option and found uh, better restoration of the center of rotation with the MPO design with much less frequent outliers. He recently published a clinical series with Dr. Blaine and Dr. Levine, looking at their early experience with this implant, 63 shoulders, average follow-up 30 months, and they found satisfactory clinical outcomes with zero cases of humeral loosening. Here's a patient that I did recently, and the reason I included this is that in this patient, I uh, wanted to use a a standard glenoid component 
of highly cross-linked polyethylene and a hybrid post. And I included this to show this is a former bodybuilder, very muscular individual, and with appropriate retractor placement and, and soft tissue releases, you can still approach the glenoid perpendicularly and maintain the bulk of the humeral head and uh, for use with this implant. So here's a quick video uh, I did a few years ago describing the technique of this implant. And it's done through a standard deltal pectoral approach. You identify the cephalic vein, cephalic vein and deltoid are retracted laterally. Much of this is done through blunt dissection. I release the upper third of the pectoralis major. In general, I tag and tenotomize the biceps for later tenodesis. In this case, I did a subscap tenotomy and I, nowadays I do an osteotomy. But a tenotomy is perfectly acceptable. You gotta make sure you do it with a knife to not cause any thermal necrosis to the tissue. Next, we're releasing the inferior capsule off the, the humeral neck. You gotta remove all your osteophytes so you can get a sense of the normal anatomy of the humerus. You gotta identify the center of the humeral head. That's the one judgment call with this, with this procedure is identifying the center of the humeral head. A guide pin is placed. We can check your version and your next shaft angle. Next, you use a, a plunge reamer, which takes away a specified amount of bone. And then here come the chamfer cuts with your cutting guide. Again, something you similar to what you'd see with a total knee. You make your posterior cut first, followed by your anterior cut. There's a new guide that's put on top, and you make your superior and your inferior cut. and then drill for your peg holes. There's trials, there's nine different sizes available. So most patients are, are adequately sized with our options available. There's a protector plate so that you don't crush the humeral head with your retractors. I use a large DARA retractor posteriorly, and here's the instrumentation coming in from the front of the shoulder. That's a sizer. Next, an awl to develop your, your starting point, and then a reamer that you can come from the front of the shoulder. This is the older style glenoid with this implant. It's almost a modified keel. There's two horizontal keels. You drill these holes and then connect the, the, these peg holes to perform these, uh, to make the keel holes. This particular implant is, is all polyethylene and cemented. We're punching out the keel holes, trialing. cementing, pressurizing. And then final implant placement. This is the older style implant, which was designed for cement. The newer style implant has got a bone ingrowth option. I still cement it in my osteoporotic individuals, but for robust males, I use the non-cemented version. We're repairing our tenotomy. Again, I, I nowadays do a osteotomy, but I had good results with the tenotomy. And that's it. So in summary, 
we're seeing more and more young active patients seeing, seeking an anatomic total shoulder. Our canal sparing implants have demonstrated safety, satisfactory clinical and radiographic results, relative durability, and our, hopefully our, straight, our revisions in the future are straightforward. Thank you. Thank you, Talif and Brett. Um, so we have about 10 minutes for questions or comments. Um, you, can, you can either raise your hand under the reactions icon and speak up, or you can um, text a question into the chat box. I'll, I'll ask I'll ask a question, uh, Brett. Um, you know, one of the, there's a lot of issues with doing surface replacements in hips, but one of the main ones is uh, risking the you know compromising the blood supply to the femoral head, and uh, that leads to some you know short and intermediate term consequences for osteonecrosis, potential loosening. Um, is there any similar phenomenon with the um, surface replacement for the shoulder? So that's a great question, Howard. Not that I'm aware of. Um, the, the loosening, there's been virtually no loosening with this implant. I have had a couple, one was mine, one was another surgeon's who had a periprosthetic fracture, which was very proximal right underneath the implant. That may be a blood supply issue, but other than those two examples, and we've done hundreds of them at our institution, I can't think of another problem related to loosening in general uh, with this implant. And we've been using it now for, we're going on four years. Okay, thank you. Um, there's comment from Dr. Matson and Angela about um, what, how proud they are of your uh, great career and this great talk. Um, also Very good. Kudos, Thank you. Also, kudos to Talif. And Dr. Worm has a question that I was also thinking about, particularly with that device called the Nano, which doesn't look very nano. It looks like it removes quite a bit of bone from um, the humeral head, and yet you don't have that support from the canal. And um, Dr. Warm asked, um, we said, great talk. How do you determine if the bone of the proximal humerus is sufficiently dense to support a stemless implant? The thumb test seems rather subjective. How do you decide if cement will help? So with using the catalyst, I, I haven't had a single case where I've had to bail to a, a, um, a stemmed implant. The, um, again, with that implant, you're preserving a lot of the, the subchondral bone. So it's, it's relatively dense. And the only problems that I've had with the osteoporotic individuals is, you know, with my retractor placement, kind of putting a dent in the, in the uh, humeral head. And in those cases, I simply cemented it and they've gone on to, to heal well. So there, there truly has not been a single instance when using that catalyst where I've had to bail on, on, on using it. Um, with the standard stemmed implants early in my career, I, I, you know, it was out of an abundance of caution. I switched, I bailed to a stemmed implant. Um, but in general, my preference is, is for the, for the catalyst. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's performed well. Okay, a um, few more questions. The next two are, are related from Dr. Roberts and Kwan. Um, if you have to convert a stemless implant to a reverse, are any of these systems modular or convertible or are you converting to a stemmed implant at that point? And then Dr. Kwan um, asked, um, can, you talk, can any of the shoulder surgeons, starting with Dr. Wyatt, or talk about their positive or negative experiences revising stemless implants into something else? So the, the standard neck cut stemless options have the ability to convert to a reverse. I'm pretty sure all of them do. And it's basically the humeral tray that they use for their standard reverse implants. Now that's not, you can't 
do a stemless reverse in the United States. That's not FDA approved, but they're definitely doing it in Europe. So when you have that implant, you can convert relatively easily to a reverse if say your rotator cuff failed. There are convertible glenoid options. I don't have a lot of experience with those. I know Biomet has a newer metal back glenoid that's easily converted to a, a reverse glenosphere as does Lima. Again, I don't have much experience with those. I do have experience revising uh, the stemless implants to standard arthroplasty or standard reverse stemmed implants. And it's very, very straightforward, is, particularly if there's not a lot of bone loss around the glenoid. Usually the glenoid is your, is your rate limiting step. And if it's an early failure for a subscap insufficiency or something like that, and there's still glenoid bone stock, very straightforward. And, and again, almost as easy as a primary reverse. Dr. Henley says, when and why do you use non-anatomic designs, e.g. spherical heads, RSA, et cetera, for garden variety OA when you started the presentation stating that anatomic designs had the best long-term results? So in general, the anatomic arthroplasty it outperforms the reverse when you know the rotator cuff is healthy and when it's done well. Um, I think the move towards making the shoulder anatomic and recreating the normal kinematics will prove to give us the best durability. You know, the, there's a lot of translation in, associated with the rotation of the humeral head. And if we can recreate the normal kinematics, I think our, our rotator cuff, particularly the supraspinatus, would be less likely to fail. Certainly we don't have that data yet. This implant, these implants have been on the market. The non-spherical ones have only been on the market for the past few years, but time will tell, but an excellent question. Um, Dr. Davies says, is it possible that PSI and better pre-op templating software with AR will remove the advantage of CSR for recreating normal um, center of rotation. Also agree revising stemless is easy. So I would say I don't, you know, it's uh, PSI, it's a, a patient specific instrumentation. All the, the implant manufacturers have their system on the market. I was trained in the old school by both Dr. Matson and, and my brother, J. Michael Wider. And it's not something that I've adopted in my practice. I think it probably is the future of shoulder arthroplasty as it becomes more available and streamlined and cheaper. I think that it certainly will improve our center of rotation. But I think there is some utility in, in recreating the normal anatomy um, of, the, of the proximal humerus, which the spherical implants simply can't do. It, it brings up, before I get to the next question, it brings up um, one other issue, Brett. Um, some of us were recently looking at contribution margin data for inpatient orthopedics um, within our system, and this is um, not including spine. And it's pretty striking that the numbers we're presented are, um, you know, put us really on the lower end of the spectrum. Um, you know, I'm talking about total uh, shoulder surgery, total knees, total hips. Um, and whereas the non-implant specialties in the outpatient surgery, the contribution margin for us as a group, you know, we're on the high end uh, for those cases. And so what kind of pressures do you get from your hospitals in terms of implant costs? It sounds like all of these designs are new and we know that those are typically more expensive. Um, are there benefits in terms of, um, you know, complication rates, uh, getting patients out of the hospitals earlier? So I, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of utility in using these newer implants when it comes to our push towards outpatient surgery. I think that there is a lot less blood loss and the morbidity of the procedure is a lot lower when you're not violating the entire humeral canal. Anyone that's done a total shoulder, a total hip, for that matter, when you start to instrument the canal, you start getting a ton of bleeding and these patients bounce back from surgery as if they had a, a shoulder scope, in my experience. 
In our institution, the prices are negotiated with all new implants to be comparable to, to what's already you know, used at the implant or used at the institution. So there's a lot of pressure to, to, for these implant companies to, to lower their prices and make it comparable to our, 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 our standard implants. We do a lot of volume. So we have that luxury uh, and that bargaining power. Um, and the, um, you know, with these, these newer implants, uh, the particularly this catalyst implant, which I'm very passionate about, it's all comes in literally one single tray of implants. And anyone who's done a total joint knows the multitude of instruments and trials. And, you know, the, the implant that I used prior to this had six trays and there's a huge strain on our system, particularly now with the pandemic and our CPD is a nightmare. It is much more reliable to have an implant that comes in one set. So I think in a lot of ways, this is, this is beneficial, not only to our patients, but our, our institutions. Yeah, thanks. We have a similar system. Our, our negotiations are actually um, led by Dr. Henley. And despite um, significant improvements in, in the pricing we're getting for our implants, uh, it's really interesting to see how much of the profit that consumes from the perspective of the hospital. Yeah, Thank you, a huge our yeah. profit margin with these implants, as we all know. So there's, yeah. there's certainly yeah. bargaining power. Yeah. And Dr. Handel said, Brett, great talk. What is the, what are the oldest patients that you can, or, or have you used the stemless implant in? So my oldest patient was a 90 year old female who developed AVN of her humeral head. I used a stemless implant in her and not sure she's living anymore, but I think she did well early on so 90 again i use it it's it's my go to i haven't done a stemmed total anatomic total shoulder in probably 3 or 4 years so even with avn no concerns about premature loosening or perhaps in a 90 so, year old you know that was the dogma that i you know my brother particularly michael kind of drilled into my head that you got to use a stemmed implant for avn and you know, I'm not sure if there, if the bone becomes viable after you start, you know, doing your cuts and all that and it heals, but he now uses stemless implants for AVN and haven't had any issues as far as we know. Are there any other questions? Well, I want to thank Dr. Khan and Dr. Wyatter. Um, it's again, as, as Dr. Matson noted, it's been great to see what a remarkable career Brett has had at this still relatively um, early phase in, in his post uh, fellowship career. And, and Brett, we will get you back here in person uh, at some point in Excellent. the not too distant future. We'd love to see you here. Terrific. Yep. So, so Good thank to see you, Dr. Matson. Yep. Great to see you, Brett. Outstanding job, and um, as we say, we will follow you with great interest. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Yep. I owe it all to you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir.